Shinji and Warhammer 40k, Chapter 31, Uncertain Space, Part 1. There's a saying that goes, amateurs talk tactics, dabblers study strategy, but the professionals look at logistics. Kozol Fyutsky threw down a report and ran a hand through his own grey hair. He leaned back and sighed. I don't know if the angels have any sense to make do with what they have, but the logistics of the Earth's cradle, it's a staggering advantage. Gendel smirked. Since it is no longer in Earth anymore, perhaps we should use Katsuragi's note. It should be referred to as the Black Moon from now on. The older man blinked, looking bewildered. Ikari, you're being surprisingly affable about this. <laughs> Do you think I should be more upset at being shown up like some petulant child? Fyutsky re realised how ludicrous that was. Well, no. It would be foolish to think, however, that just because Gendel could be so cold-blooded logical, he was predictable. I am no Superman, Sensei, nor do I make any claims to infallibility. What I am, however, is a man who knows what he wants. He tapped the files on his desk. Willingly or unwillingly, what's important is how something can further that goal. Pride is nothing compared to that end, and seals just one of many roads to power. The older man sighed. Still, things can only get worse from here on. You must learn how to look at the bright side, Sensei. Bright side? What bright side? This is the worst setback since Second Impact. I didn't think we'd ever need to use mass graves anymore. It's hard enough trying to identify loved ones when they're missing their heads, but trying to recover from all the damage to the city. Gendal pulled out another folder. At least now we can follow these plans to turn Tokyo Free into a true fortress city. He stared at his gloved right hand. If the angels manage to touch Adam or Lilith, that would remove any chance of achieving our goal. Unlike the angels or seal, we have something to see beyond impact. <laughs> So we should focus upon the immediate threat. I'm glad you see your son isn't one. We're going to need all the help we can get. Gendo leaned forward and looked grim. No, Sensei. The bright side is that prophecies are all worthless. We knew from the start that they couldn't be relied upon. Now we can discard them entirely. The old man thought he'd put aside all fear of Gendo, but again at that moment remembered... Now that he couldn't even imagine to just what depths the Elder Akari would sink, just to get his way. Regardless, there's something else we must consider. Gendo pushed one of the many buttons under his desk, and a recording began to play. It's not that simple, Asuka. Following nerve will doom humanity, just as surely as letting the angels win. The extremism of two sides is folly. We must have a third option. I will be a tool no longer, Asuka. I will be free. Instead of the elevation of egotistical aims, the short-sighted ambition of the mortal fuel, there must be the greater good. I'm not saying things aren't hard right now, but what can helping the angels do? Stop this, Karu! I have no choice. Devils were once angels too, and to be free, I need the tools of my enemy. The second child knows. Gendel said firmly. Ikari, you... Fyutsky was afraid, though not for himself. Surely you can't be thinking. You can't replace her now. Would you care to stand in the way if that is necessary, Sensei? The old man clenched his fist and grit his teeth. Not since a very long time had he felt the urge to punch his student in the mouth. While he could objectively live with the idea of murdering every living thing on the planet since that could be excused as the human ascension and that he would suffer much the same fate. The thought of just callously silencing a child to maintain their secrecy, it was something else. He glared past the desk. Was it enough to rebel against Gendo's scenario, to abandon the plan that would grant them back you? He exhaled and opened his hand. He felt so cold for no, it was not enough. He damned himself. Fortunately, it is not a problem. Gendel continued, feigning kindness after knowing just how uncomfortable he made his sole true confessor and co-malefactor. I already assume that the third child knows, and this post is much of a problem. Very little. The boy has a certain tendency to limit himself to the moral acts, and as such can only help advance our purposes. 
So you may be foolish enough to believe she can persuade the enemy out of fighting, but the worst that can happen is she dies for that folly. These children pilot the most fearsome weapons known to man they carry. I'm sure your son would disapprove of trying to initiate impact. Gendo frowned a bit. Perhaps, but, oh, but for the moment, if he wants to serve as a shield, then let him take the blows that would send Nerve to its knees. No, if there is ever any threat to Nerve, it will not come from that direction. He's too loyal to attach to his people here. I can't help but feel you're underestimating him, Akari. He's intensely loyal, maybe, but also provokes that same level of loyalty in others. I'm sure many would rather he occupied that seat than you. Needless to say, I'm among them. He didn't say. On the contrary, if anything, I am overestimating his abilities. His power and influence are borrowed. What happens when those factors collect? Regardless, I'm willing to grant him an equal stake in this great game. I'm going to proceed in confidence that he can live up to his boasts. Gendo opened his right hand and stared down at the telltale bulge of Adam's embryonic form. Whatever he does, succeed or fail, it will only help us further. A much more immediate threat to our scenario is the Black Moon, the third option. I'm sure Seal finds that as unpalatable as I do. What would that be? Mankind? Angels? Something in between? The power of angels entwined with human cunning, a combination that might well be unbeatable. Seal miscalculated horribly here, Sensei. I will not make the same mistake. What are you planning now, Ikari? Chess is a game representative of war, but references to pawns and knights in the stratagems over actual events can be overused. Past all strategy and subtlety, there's brute force. The last angel attack recognised that. Gendo tapped at the picture of the Earth's cradle. So we must be more unsubtle still. Gendo turned the picture over and wrote, The Third. Futsuki looked on in horror and some fascination. Since the younger Ikari moved into Tokyo 3, Gendo, and to a lesser extent Seal, lost the momentum of their earlier opening gambits. However, the elder Ikari had started out as a political troublemaker, almost dropping out of college and into the most powerful man in the world. It had been a while since Futsuki saw that cold, uncaring mind work in full concentration. The words were underlined, and below them was written, Inevitable? A cross mark, like a large plus sign. Defeat. I said that everything the boy can do, fail or succeed, will only help us, Gendo said. He looked up and his glasses glinted. Shortly, Seal will come to me begging for help. He wrote again. Total disarmament. Third impact will happen, Sensei. I don't need the scrolls to tell me that. He smirked. Seal, right now, is trying to adjust events to the most liberal interpretations of the scrolls. But with them obsolete, I will directly write destiny itself. Futsuki shivered. Don't tell me you're getting a god complex now, Akari. Don't be facetious, Sensei. I will kill God. I did it before. I can do it again. Ah, peace and quiet at last. It was one thing to be drained right down to the bone, and another to feel tired of your own soul. The little bits of hope that showed in the eyes of those left behind was barely enough to sustain him. The most common feeling was shock. Then despair, so bleak it was beyond suffering. It tasted like death. Anger, now that he could work with. Pain was a reminder of life. But anger, nothing else can burn through a lifetime like anger, like the need for revenge. He looked out the hallway windows towards the city, half hidden by the mountain slope. While fortunately its power distribution was left more or less intact, there were leprous spots of darkness upon the grid. There were simply no longer any buildings there to light up the night. He leaned against the door and shakily brought his key up. Despite what people seemed to think or even expect, his physical limits were rather just below the norm. That frail appearance was no ruse. And of course, the mind relied upon the body. Burning sugars could only go so far without reserves. I think I can understand now something about why masochists behave as they do, he said to himself in that empty hallway. His brain felt as if floating out of his head. Everything felt so clear, so ridiculous. 
The body could perfectly produce its own consciousness-altering chemicals, and fortunately only in trying to shut itself down before the damn fool that owns it could cause any more damage. Query. Does life represent an increase in order or entropy in the universe? He asked aloud. There was, as expected, no answer. It was a simple modular apartment at the outskirts of Trident Base, and of course there were other residents. It was just that most of them were either dead, on duty, or already asleep. It was almost two in the morning after all. The door swung open and stopped with a bump. He flicked on the light. Hold on, what the... Shinji saw the boxes he'd brought into Japan seem to have spontaneously multiplied. The containers now filled half of his rather spartan bedroom. I thought I made it clear I wasn't going to accept any gifts. Man had sworn to uphold his meagre requests. For a little bit of fondness, she was a hellion ready to punish all who dared refuse his plea. He picked up a card on one of the boxes. Shinji boggled at the sight and brought out his cell phone. He hurriedly pushed the, sh- the speed dial. There was a sleepy, Mushy Mushy, from the other end. Hi, Maya. How's it going? Yeah, uh, why the hell am I getting tribute from the Yakuza? He tried to control his voice, but ended up shouting anyway. What have you been doing? Maya Buki turned aside and gave Ray a bland look. He says after having swindled the Americans out of two cruisers and the prototype nuclear reactor... <laughs> That's not the point, Shinji added. I thought, well, all right, I suppose it is foolish to hope I would just be normal again here. It's still a hassle, though. I didn't want anyone to do anything special just for a birthday gift. We have secured your supply lines, Ray put in, her tone faintly scolding. When even the official channels fail, who else but the most unscrupulous would dare to smuggle in whatever it is we may need? Maya then said into the speakerphone. She rubbed at her shoulder, then shrugged. Besides, it was fun. Do we really need any better reason? I guess not, he laughed weakly. Now why don't you get down here so we can properly give you your birthday present? Shinji's right cheek twitched. Thank you, but no, I'm too tired. Then in a softer voice. I've been asked so many times. Is it really going to be all right? I've lied so much today. I'm really too tired. Oh, I guess. Sorry to bother you then. No, it's all right. It's just that... Thank you. Please don't misunderstand. I want to have earned to rest. In his mind, something was screaming in utter outrage and unbelief. Fortunately, he was too tired to even care. He slumped face down onto the bed and slid into dreamless sleep. Thus ended the first day of Shinji Akari's return to Tokyo 3. The news of his return spread quickly. While the general mood was cautious optimism, there was one place that was simply overjoyed. They didn't give any thought about foreign involvement, nor how much Shinji Akari was involved in that. He was back. There was enough. At least the favoured son of a little town up at the hills of Sendai was alive, not, as they had feared, rotting away in the wilderness somewhere. There was some concern if he'd forgotten them in all the bustle of the big city. The same day as the boys set foot in Tokyo Free, however, mail arrived at his uncle's place. By the wording, it was clear it was written several days beforehand. The letter first conveyed his apologies about the necessity of keeping his silence, then various perfunctory passages about their well-being and good fortune. From the tone, it was also possible to discern that he didn't really know how to fake interest in their small town concerns, and apologised again. He was sure they were safe, and that was enough to warm his heart. However, it was also important that they remain safe. I know young Master Akari is a saving people thing, but this is getting ridiculous. Insulting, even, said the police chief, Ayane Mitsugane's father. He gave his daughter a mildly apologetic look. What? It's true. We should be able to take care of ourselves. It says here we made a few enemies while wandering, and they wouldn't hesitate to kill and slash or torture anyone who might have an emotional attachment to. It's raw. The angels are not the only enemies. Shinji Akari's uncle noted. I think we shouldn't be worrying him at all. It'd be really bad if all it takes to force him into something is to hold us hostages, said Ayane. Well, I don't want to die even then. Hoko Minase put down her cup of tea and smiled slightly at her old friend's expression of betrayal. Think about it. Even if we refuse to become bargaining chips, he'd still find a way to feel guilty about it. He's ours, no matter how far he's roamed or what he'd done in Tokyo Free. This is where he grew up, and we're never going to stop being his people. There was a fairly disturbing undercurrent there, 
but the adults chose to ignore it. It was a literal town, completely unremarkable, with but one claim to fame. So it was that the Holcomb Mansion played host to a formal reading of the letter. It was a small group, but even the mayor was there, the chief of police likewise, and had brought his daughter with him. Ayane and Minase sat off to one side, after helping serve tea, to let the adults talk. The letter was insistent on them being there. So he's asking us, how do we think the public would react to a rapid draft? The mouse of the house, who had multiplied his wealth several times over through Shinji Kari's advice, just shrugged. If that's what he wants, then it's probably a good idea. No, he doesn't say anything to that, one way or another. He's been out of the country too long, Shinji's uncle replied. Besides, he's asking us as common citizens. Imagine we never had anything to do with the boy. How would we take the government and act in conscription with hardly any warning? The chief of police frowned. I don't think that would be well received. It's not just that it brings up bad memories. Not even after impact if we try using anything other than a purely volunteer armed force. Even splitting the JSDF into the JSSDF and JAF was for the sake of a certain phobia against centralised regime. Besides, it takes time and money to train up enough people. Our economy's bad enough as it is, the mayor added. Where would we pull the resources to create a new citizen army? How do we handle the uh, declining workforce? Besides, even if money or supplies aren't an issue, there's just not enough time. The chief finished. The alternative is letting foreign armies land on Japanese soil. Those there twitched. Six Russian tanks, accompanied by 40 crew. Two platoons of Chinese elite guard, 50 men in all. Then there were those strange Tibetan Buddhists. Not even impact could dent the cultural reserve against the Gaijin. More than ever, they hated feeling so powerless, which was perhaps why they so relished seeing their own stand at the head of so much raw destructive power. His uncle more so than others. After all, he was one of the few people on the planet capable of actually appreciating the boy's alterations. Bloody brilliant! I had a genius living under my roof! Too bad there was no Nobel Prize for awesome, though. It was even more interesting, continuing not to know how the boy managed that. Had it really been just a year since he left home? At the same time, however, he could imagine. What was it worth in human lives? How about this then? Stopping up on standard disaster procedures, reinforced shelters should be built or designated in major cities in case of some strange calamity, or at least a tsunami watch. The mayor blinked. Most of the world's most populated cities were constructed near the shorelines, and as such, drowning was the leading cause of death in the first few hours after impact, followed by crushing, bursting, and various states of fleshy bits leakage. Just... Uh, that would be worse, the chief Mitsugane added. What's well, good for Tokyo Free isn't necessarily good for the rest of the country. For any rapid evacuation to work, we're going to need not just supplies and a good site, but also enough personnel to convince people to actually evacuate in time. The police officer held clearly in his mind just how much of an idiotic animal mind the panicking mob had. Unlike the military, the police held power only in reflection of their government stability. In times of crisis, their badges conferred only an aura of authority, just not the same as armoured plate or fully automatic weapons. And again, the problem is time. Sinking concrete foundations is different from just handing out bolt guns. Hmm, costs a lot more too. Why is he asking this? The mayor was a pudgy man who had once been a high school principal. He retired long before having to deal with the town's famous, or even infamous, resident. What does he expect us to do? I can't accept that the only thing we outside of Tokyo can do is to uh, hope that the angels don't notice just how helpless we are. Shinji's uncle coughed. There is still that little clause in our revised constitution about a militia. Bolt weapons are still illegal, the police chief responded. And for good reason. I haven't seen anything that's so much a cop killer. Many ammunition is too damn expensive to be useful for most people anyway. The mayor began to sweat. So nothing? There's nothing we can really do to protect ourselves? Just this one town. Maybe we could pull something together. Seeing the devastation wrought on Tokyo 3 and the pointed questions from that letter, it implied another attack was inevitable and their sleepy little hollow would be inflicted the same terror that ravaged the fortress city. 
We, uh, we don't have anything to do with this. It's not our fight. Damn that Akari. It's all his fault. It's war, said Shinji's uncle. It's been too long. We gave a promise to forsake war itself. That's part of our nation's identity now, as we forgot just how terrible and indiscriminate total war can be. The two teenage girls just laughed, drawing the attention of their elders. Father, this is silly, said Minase. If it's a gamble, then why don't we just have faith in that he actually has some reason for this? Daughter, I do have faith, but faith has never saved someone from being eaten. The Hulk Hell Patriarch smirked. We can build as many bunkers, buy as many weapons as he or you would want. But as Mitsugane-san here said, the problem is time. Can we actually get anything prepared that might actually be useful before it's too late? Everyone there turned to Shinji Kari's uncle, asking with their eyes, He won't just abandon us, would he? The contents of the letter implied that. Take care of yourselves, I've too much else to worry about, was the tone. Ayane clutched at her old friend's hand and smiled. The little boy that they knew would not be so callous. Faith in his good nature. It was all they had left. Apparently Shinji Akari wanted an airfield to be built nearby. Holko Construction had plenty of practice at levelling ground. It takes some time to move the machinery, but a simple enough job. I suppose I could absorb the costs, said the owner. Shinji's uncle coughed meaningfully and continued to read. Looks like you don't need to. Can he do that? The mayor asked, disbelieving. Just ask the JSSDF to mark it as a refueling depot? Well, actually... Reading forward a little, he added, It's already done. All hoko san needs to do is lay out the grounds. The JSSDF will pay for the structures and jet fuel. A slight grin. And if for some reason a few gunships or a transport plane needs to land? This is completely ridiculous, the police chief added, rubbing at his head. There had to be a limit to just how far a, go a boy would go to impress your daughter. Most people simply had enough of Tokyo Free. Every day was a gamble, through low property costs and high rages, set against the possibility of attack. The almost farcical exchange in the past months had almost convinced many that it was safe. Prosperity and speculation soared around the city, with its in inexhaustible industrial demand. The facts of reality returned, as if in swift, terrible vengeance, having been ignored for so long. There is a difference between thrilling and frightening, conflict and slaughter, hope and desperation. Not even Shinji Akari's return could change that. If anything, that only made it worse. Just having him around increased the flammability of concrete. There was already a massive exodus clogging the highways around the city. Property values dropped to almost zero, not that there were many usable lots left. Tokyo 3 was reduced almost to rubble. Nerve was a paramilitary organisation and needed extensive civilian support to function. Practically all the city's food supply had to be imported, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Most of Nerve's employees were civilians, whose families were lured to the city with the promises of a good life in the future capital. They all lived above ground. The geofront was a secure area, not for living in. As people fled out of the city, so did Nerve lose a lot of critical personnel. Public utilities and the essential government duties were staffed by civilians not necessarily employed by Nerve. The organisation had to defend humanity against angels. They shouldn't have to worry about making sure there was electricity, running water and useful TV reception. Without those, the ability to fight back against the alien invader was severely reduced. This was domain of logistics, not strategy. There were those who had to remain, no matter what they'd lost. Nerve employees had the chance to quit, but few did. They knew it was their duty to stand up for the rest of the world. They sent their families away, and there was much shouting and angry recriminations to be heard, but they stayed. Trident Base and its military assets had to stay. Literally, they had no choice. In fact, their numbers only increased out of the disaster. Of the civilians, enough remained that schools actually opened up a few days after the attack. Asuka and Ray walked to school that day, mindful of the carnage in their way. The stench of burnt and rotting meat still hung over the city like a cloud. Bulldozers had to clear the roads, and now and then they heard the distinctive clank rumble of the Lehman Rust tanks. Seventy tons of monstrous firepower, some of them even had dozer blades bolted onto the front to add to their ugliness. Nothing so exemplified the city's new and hard-learned roariness even in the midst of rebuilding. Never again would they be caught so off guard. Complacency was the first and surest enemy. Nagisa did this, Ray said offhand, while watching an ambulance whisk screaming past. 
I will grant that most of what he said was true, but actions should speak louder than words. He's our enemy, Pilate saw you. He doesn't have to be. I know he's not doing this because he wants to. Shouldn't you feel a little more sympathetic? He's the closest thing to a brother you have. He doesn't want to be a tool. But we are all tools. We each serve a function. Without that function, our life has no meaning, and humanity would be destroyed by the angels. Ray turned aside and her voice held an odd craver. He is not my brother. You are closer to me than he ever will. Gee, thanks, Oscar replied dully. Sister Ibuki is mine. I trust my life to pilot to carry. My loyalty is supposedly to nerve. Nagisa has only himself. He cannot be trusted. Unfortunately, in her focus of concerns, Asuka only heard and immediately latched on to the last part of the sentence. But that's the, that's the point! If we just knew he didn't have to be alone! It's a bleak existence. No one should have to do that. I thought I didn't need anyone once. I thought it was enough for me to be strong. But I'm stronger now than I ever could have been at it alone. He's like me. He's aching inside. If I could just reach him! Would you trust Nagisa and place his welfare above all those who trusted you to defend them? That's a low blow, Ayanami, Asuka hissed. The blue-haired girl gave the smallest of shrugs. In war, it is important to decide where your loyalties lie. If you are conflicted, you will not be able to perform to the fullest efficiency. As they walked, workers would stop whatever it was they were doing and stare until the pilots passed by. There were no condemnation in their eyes, but simply a vast uncertainty. It was as if the girls were part of something unreal, a dream world they could never touch, a place of safety resolutely fenced from them. Asuka turned her eyes away. And I suppose that's all that matters to you. I'm not willing to give up myself into being anyone's tool either. I'm not a doll, I'm a human being. As Pilot Takari would say, our job is to kill angels and save innocent people. If we cannot do that, we will betray the responsibilities that come with our power. Asuka paused. She nodded, then frowned. Baka Shinji, showing up that one time, then disappearing again. I'd listen to that if he would just show up to try activating the Ava again. What's he got to hide this time? There were just 15 people left in their class. The pilots were still there, of course. Kirishima saw it as a patriotic duty. She would literally bite anyone that dared suggest she leave. Kensuke Edo was employed by Innes, even if his accountant father wasn't really essential to Nerve. He'd never leave. The elder Suzuharas were employed by Nerve in the weapons division. They were too important to the war effort. For the Harakis, well, altogether they decided to stay. Hikari because Toji was there. Kodama because, like hell am I going to just give up and let that little bitch Agano have Hyuga-san without a fight. And Azomi because she had to keep her sisters sane. Asuka licked her lips and stood in front of the class. A few months earlier, she wouldn't even have bothered to think about it. However, at the time, she bowed low to them and apologised for her failure to protect. Her power had proved insufficient. She could admit to that without destroying her own self-esteem. It's all right. We don't blame you, so you, she was answered. Yeah, it's not like the Evangelion can fight at ground level. You tried to end the big battle quickly. That's the most we could expect. You're still our hero. Let me show you the great. We have to the next one for my mom, okay? This was recognition. This was trust. This was the proof she was no doll to be played around with. Those who remained had faith unshakable upon Nerve and the Ava. Nothing could intimidate them away from their own duty. She was a knight of the land, and to belong was a precious feeling. If she could just get the others to realise it wasn't a weakness, but something worth protecting. That was all overarching logic of the greater good, after all. When the enemy becomes an ally, he ceases to be the enemy just as surely as destroying him. Kensuke stood by the door and bellowed. Presenting His Excellency Ikari Shinji the First. All hail! He bowed and stood aside, gesturing to the doorway. Shinji walked in and cuffed the back of his friend's head. You promised, Kensuke. Sorry, dude. I just couldn't help it. Shinji just sighed and looked up. His smile was thin, his eyes watery. I'm... I'm back... He took in all the few faces in the room and it was like a red-hot blade into the heart. It seemed like an eternity since he was gone, and even if in his wanderings had idealised the peace and acceptance he had felt within his home, that it could turn into hell under his watch was something he never dreamed. Ayanami, 
She gave him a rare, real smile. Saw you. Her eyes held doubt, despair, but also that stubborn defiance that he found so charming. Kirishima. Uh-oh, that's naked lust. He felt like running away. He heard a cough from behind. You know, if you're going to block the doorway, Mr. Carey, I'm perfectly happy to turn around and go home and sleep the rest of the day. Oh no, you don't, you lazy teacher! Hikari reflexively yelled out from inside the room. She then blushed at her loss of composure. Toji put a hand on her shoulder and waved with the other, as if to say, What the hell? It's just Shinji. No need to get embarrassed. Yo, Hikari, come in. Take a load off. Toji acted like some sort of country host, showing off his exquisitely furnished abode. He gestured towards his friend's usual seat. Shinji bowed and sat. Thank you. He had the fight to control his emotion. Thanks. To all of you. It's good to be back. He blinked, he blinked repeatedly and looked up. It's really good. The expected barrage of questions didn't arrive. There were so many questions, but there was one thing they were most curious about. They held back, for it felt rather silly to ask. Finally, Kensuke gave voice to the question, the first to do so since Shinji's arrival. For the past days, everyone who saw him had tried to just ignore the weirdness. What's with the thing on your head? Oh, this? Shinji touched a gold-plated laurel wreath. It's a hat. Silence stretched out. That makes no sense whatsoever, Kensuke replied. Uh, how, do, how should I put this? How many people do you see wearing hats nowadays? Shinji asked. I'd seen them puzzled the last time they saw someone with a real hat, not just a cap. Close to never, actually. He continued. Someone like that would really stand out, right? Hats are supposed to shield the head from the elements. Likewise, if I put this on, that makes it easier to pick me out from the crowd and pick me up out of trouble. The last words were said in a peevish whisper. His guards, specially chosen for their size and strength, like to play pick up Shinji, throw and catch, as the way to get him out of being surrounded. And here I thought you were advertising for the Olympics, Asuka snarked, grinning. She lost that grin in realising the event might have to be cancelled. So you're back for good now, Toji asked next. What about your father? Shinji nodded. He can't touch me. I've got diplomatic immunity. That was also the reason why he could not so simply move back into his old lodgings under Nerve, he explained. He begged them to consider him as just one of the guys again. His ambassador position was a piece of legal protection, and may in the end help serve as precedent for other pilots. Really? What country? Man asked, even going so far as to have double citizenship. The UN seemed determined to hold Shinji as a buffer against Nerve's tricks. She knew there were some battles she couldn't fight. Politics was something beyond her abilities. She couldn't protect him there, and it rankled her own pride as a soldier. Asuka looked suspicious. Why would he so easily consent to being a tool? Shinji tapped his laurel crown again. Greece, of course. It was a small enough nation, too damaged even 15 years after impact, to present no serious threat and would benefit from the prestige of being a second home. It increased their political weight and perhaps though a part of the less defended European landmass, the people of Tokyo 3 would put a little more priority in protecting them from angel attacks. Kensuke laughed. He knew full well why Greece was chosen. There were more than a few flags that bore the double-headed Aquila, yet the source could be traced back through the millennia in Rome's influence, into Jupiter, then to Zeus Amon. The Hellenic emblem was there. The lightning bolt was there. And ever has the most valuable export of Greece been its people. Your custodians are Greek, aren't they? He asked. Well, n not all of them. I mean, they are mercenaries, but most of them. Yeah, some are from Turkey. Kensuke and Yang shared a look. Both then laughed freely. Kensuke gasped for breath and had to wipe tears of sudden gut pain. Damn it, Carrie. I can't call you a magnificent bastard. You left with barely more than the clothes on your back and you returned with your own army, he shouted. You're definitely Gendo Akari's son. Did you plan it that way? No, Shinji denied frantically. It just happened. Hey. Yang shook his head. Pitiful, really. You're under a powerful curse. What's so funny? Asuka asked. <laughs> they carry the lightning. They bring the thunder. Kensuke crowed. 
Macedonians! This poor fool has Macedonians marching behind him! Yang shouted while slapping down on the table. The strongest fundamental force in the universe. Irony! Just like when he himself got the allegiance of the steppes. For someone who wanted to evade rumours of world conquest, there was a whole heap of unfortunate implications upon his host. Shinji grumbled on. He felt calculating what looks wash over him. What the hell have you been up to, Akari? They ache to know. Where have you been? Ray asked softly. <laughs> that tiny, plaintive note to her voice, discernible only to those who knew her. What a surprising guilt attack. Uh, here and there, I suppose. Greece, Brazil, Egypt, he winced. Despite all the hardships he suffered along the way, it did sound much like a holiday. Been a busy little globetrotter, haven't we? Kensuke said. He sat backwards on his chair and asked, Was there much kicking of ass? Shinji winced. He fought briefly upon that irritable donkey up on timber. Yes, he had to answer. Yes, there was. A low, ooh, spread through the class. Kensuke's eyeglasses glinted and his grin was wide. You've been around, Ikari? A brief pause. So, did you have any interesting conversations with women? Kensuke seemed unconcerned with the dangerous glares directed his way. Shinji fought not to cower when those gazes from three girls turned to him. Damn you, Ada. Curse you and your thesaurus. He remembered having a hideout inside a Brazilian whorehouse. That was a especially scary time. I wasn't out there for fun, all right? I had to negotiate for some things. Shinji rubbed at his head, saying he'd genuinely interesting in conversations with many older women, one of them from several thousand years ago, would never have gone over well. Wait, why was the air suddenly so cold? Asuka stood over him, faintly shaking, her fists clenched. Three months and not a word, she whispered. And the ironic thing was that Kaoru, their enemy, was the only one who cared to send her notice of his travels, remembering there was worth in her worrying. Everyone watched with held breaths, waiting for the breaking of that tension. What was Soyu doing? What was she thinking? Was she angry? Now go, now, Asuka heard someone yell inside. Don't let him get away again. Make it unmistakable that he belongs to you. What the hell? She didn't fully realise what she was doing, but recognised such fear in Shinji's face. She admitted that she enjoyed seeing it, maybe. Asuka also didn't find anything strange in the flow of her thoughts. On second thoughts, go get the blue-haired girl and that military brat. Might as well call for reinforcement from that woman you work with. At first chance, overpower him, tie him down, bring him to a locked room and make sure he cannot escape from his fate. I have waited far too long. You have waited far too long. Yeah, I have. He abandons me like that. Why should I accept him back? Because you must. Do you have any idea how many chances he had while roaming around the world? Do you? Do you know how many he refused? Um, oh look, he's panicking. How cute. All of them? <sighs> exactly. He's an idiot. But at least he is your idiot. Shinji slammed his own head into the desk. It looked as if he tried to bow an apology, but just forgot there was something in the way. Bam! He knocked himself out. Everyone watching winced. Asuka blinked and wondered what she was doing there. He has not changed much. I'm relieved said Ray. It could only be called a victory by the most generous of summations, and not even Tokyo Free's own broadcasting service dared to call it that. The city suffered to serve as the early warning system for the rest of the world. They managed to beat back the infestation with weapons and techniques learned in the Siberian reaches. In both cases, the relative remoteness or closed-in terrain of the regions plus immediate armed response were critical to containing the damage. Like in most of the fanciful zombie holocaust scenarios, the same happening in a crowded metropolis could easily turn the city streets into a concrete jungle of mindless slaughter. The Siberian worm plague had barren open country, and Tokyo Free had the benefit of ready shelters. Bolt guns were effective, 
but can never be mass-produced in sufficient quantity to calm the other nations. In fact, mass-produced bolt guns might only worsen the situation, as a high-caliber ammunition were overkill for anything less than an elephant, and could punch through most known body armor. This made it a perfect terror weapon for criminal scum, as the police and military would be less inclined to use guns capable of reducing their targets to unidentifiable chunks. But the lessons were clear. It could happen any time, anywhere, and there'd be almost no defence. The only solution was massive firepower. Expensive firepower. It was impossible to truly prepare. Fear choked the earth, except for one place. The worst had already happened as far as Tokyo 3 was concerned, and better, they had hope. The very personification of that eventual human victory had returned to his home and his people. This didn't necessarily please everyone in Japan. It was a white unmarked van parked in front of the school. Rika Izuna got out and stretched. She was wearing then a sporty white jacket over a business black dress. Her eyeglasses were still large, round and further accenting the deceptively babyish shape of her face. The driver turned around and asked the cameraman, What, is she suicidal or something? Coming into Tokyo free? Everyone knows she's got a real mad on to bring down a carry. Why'd you still stay with this chick? The cameraman just sighed. You people don't even know my name, do you? Rika Zuna's long-suffering accessory. But then, he supposed it was better than being recognised negatively. I suppose it's to keep her from getting herself killed. She needs me, whether or not she realises it. So I stay. He shrugged. Or maybe I'm just emotionally masochistic that way. You're weird, dude, the driver said with a laugh. It's a pity. You're the type that would get along well in third Tokyo more than you'd ever fit in with second Kyoto. The score was recognised no goal zone for all reporters. Guards were not needed to enforce that. Everything about the pilots that was worth giving out for public consumption were already used up through the months. In the end, they were just kids, with a unique and rather tedious task. Rika Izuna waited outside. Not even she dared to trespass upon that unofficial contract. Why can't you just let her carry go? The cameraman asked. I can't pretend it's just out of journalistic fervour anymore. The only news you really care about is regarding that kid. It's an obsession, Rika. It's creepy. What are you trying to say? She replied without looking back. It's not like he's doing anyone any harm. What's the point in destroying him? It's unhealthy for you and for me since I have to carry all your stuff. Then go away. I know what people are saying about me. Stupid sheep. Well, I know you have a reason. Look, I'm on your side here. I know you feel it's the right thing to do. At least, let me know. I don't have to explain myself to you. If you don't like it, just go away. Just because I let you touch me doesn't mean you get to judge me. If it's too much trouble for you, just go. Man, she's at fine bitchy form today. He tightened his expression, forcing down any anger. Oddly enough, he'd been around her long enough to realise it was her own way of protecting. Driving him away as her own career crashed and burned, tackling her own suspicions alone. Something about it all frightened her enough that she was willing to throw her own life away. You're not getting rid of me that easy. If it's that important to you, it's important enough to me. I'm not saying I'm over for or against the carry, but I don't see what you see. He patted the camera. But what's wrong with saying just what it is you hate about the kid? I don't hate him, per se, she spat back. But what he does to people, it's faith. Blind faith, and his stupid faith. He's still just a boy among children sent to fight to the death. Why is it that no matter how I look, I can't see anything but a tyrant? What was the worth of all the sacrifice to get to this point? What about the lessons of democracy our country had to learn through blood and fire and shame? She let out her breath and sagged slightly. What was the point of living through impact? The things I've seen in old Tokyo. You... Wow, I didn't know you actually care about things like that. Rika had naturally abrasive, take-charge personality, making up in intelligence and daring her otherwise easily overlooked physical stature. She was used to being unloved and being on her own. I don't, she sneered back. People are animals, for all the talk of civilization and culture. <laughs> the moment their comfortable little slices of the world are disturbed, they return to following behind any goddamn alpha figure. Morality and brutality is defined only by whoever holds power at the time. Truth is ugly. This was what her own experience had taught her. Truth must be told anyway, for it was the only revenge the weak had over the mighty. 
So what's the problem then? It's not like this place wasn't a fascist estate before anyway. Remember the other Akari? You're a fool if you think the son's actually a tool against the father. Isn't it far more likely they have some common goal? Uh, maybe. World Conquest kind of trite, isn't it? Great people are measured by the number of people they trample to get their way. It's better if people realise that before it's too late. She sniffed and pushed back her glasses. I'm not out to discredit the boy, but to remind the world of the reality. He's just a boy. Are we incapable of learning from history? Cults of personality are always parasitic. Damn him, he makes everyone else around him stupid. What about... Oh, Yang? You're double the idiot if you think he of all people will ever stop being a threat. Another so-called great man of history comes here just to teach a junior high class. How could that possibly be anything but suspicious? No, I mean, him. Her cameraman pointed to the Chinese man just leaving the school, and with him was Shinji Akari. The two seemed to be conversive lively, and even their respective guards remained a respectful distance away. Rika Zuna took a deep breath and moved to meet them. She stood to bar their way, right at the gate. Mr. Akari, could we please have a moment of your time? The camera was already rolling. She was daring the security to drag her off. The two figures of living history blinked in unison, then looked at each other, their expression saying, Can you believe you're seeing what I'm seeing? It was, of course, also deeply irritating, as if they held her beneath notice. Well, that was what she was best at. Her life was as a spike to pop all the pompous egos, from politicians to modern idols. She would be noticed. She wouldn't be squashed. No one would ever call her a cockroach again. One of the Section 2 agents moved closer, but mindful of not causing an unseemly ruckus in front of the students. Miss Azuna, there will be a press release and a proper time to conduct an interview. On the contrary, the best time for an interview is spontaneous, when someone's true thoughts can be expressed instead of some lines pre-digested for public consumption, she replied all too sweetly, facing away from the flunky. The guards bristled, but were held back by Yang's light amused chuckle. At the very least, I have to admire your simple daring, Miss Azuna. Still, too abrupt is also not good. We're a little worn out from our school tasks, and appointment is really for the better of everyone concerned. She took that as condescending, and refused to be talked out so easily. The public needs to know. Is it real? What just happened? Was it really that unavoidable? Can Shinji Akari carry their faith, or is he just a figure to make people forget the failures of their own government in protecting their own? Her cameraman gulped. There was bravery and flat-out recklessness. The students were gathering around the scene. Please, Mr. Akari, your own words right now would be much more comforting than any prepared speech. Shinji nodded. It was a rather gruesome aftermath. The standard, they will be avenged declarations were inappropriate. Not that he could really assure anyone it wouldn't happen again. A press release would, however, give people what they needed to hear, even if nothing of it could actually be done. I suppose I could answer a few questions, right? Mm, I'm sorry if I don't end up answering them well. Rika Zuna smirked. That self-effacing pose, eh? How utterly false. If thought of in terms of physical combat, she immediately closed in past her opponent's guard. How is it that the armies of three nations accede to your expertise in deciding when it's unavoidable to take civilian casualties? The humble act was flawed, perhaps even insulting, when it was clear he had some physical force at his back. To hide it was to deny the public the benefit of that strength. Why should they trust someone who presents a false face? Interesting. If I get annoyed here, she could build that up into a character flaw. Hmm. She actually believes she's doing me a favour, and maybe she's right. It's terrible to live under the shadow of so many expectations. Shinji shook his head. I don't decide that, Izuna-san. The military services perform under their own chain of command. I was just along for the ride. Bullshit on that, she whispered. The Section 2 agents approached closer, but were again held back by a gesture from Yang. Rika ignored the little courtesy, forging ahead with her questioning. You and your soldiers charge right in, shooting and burning everything in your way. Those people were just terminated, without any call to surrender. She pointed aside to one of the guards, a particularly large and blonde-haired man. There were... Things designed specifically for the mass slaughter of helpless civilians, and they were directly under your authority. How do you reconcile this current law against private armies and private justice? 
Yang hmmed and rubbed his chin. Mm, technically, it can be vigilantism if the UN had not already granted a special exemption beforehand. And that's what pisses me off, Rika Zuna shouted inside. Should laws really be just thrown aside that easily for the sake of convenience? To accommodate one person? To accommodate one person, no. To better protect the survival of the human race, yes. Yang shrugged. Tokyo 3 seems a testbed for different approaches these days. The first Akone PDF is neither JSSDF or regular military. It's a war unlike anything ever fought before. And after all, he was primarily his, a historian. Thank you, Admiral Yang. However, I must ask you again, Mr. Akari. She obliquely pointed out that someone else answering Shinji's questions for him was just as evasive as refusing to answer. No one disputes your piloting ability. What have you been doing that makes you qualified to judge these things? If I say I'm not qualified, it's rather doubtful why I'm allowed to have so much authority. It's not like any of us, of us can actually explain it. Faith on each other just doesn't sound sufficient here. It would be truthful, but foolish, to reveal what I've really been up to. Just because he was out of Javal didn't mean the test would end. If he couldn't reason out such simple doubts, the only other alternative was to use force to ensure the proper steps towards the survival of the human race. It was rather puzzling. The more he tried to be polite and obliging, the more heads of state acted like he was flat out threatening them. At least the Javali and Hellenic groups were easy to understand, even if he couldn't explain. All he had to do was beat down their strongest a few times. He scratched at the side of his head. Then... It just boils down to a moral right, right? It's pointless to lead where others don't follow. So the question is, who imparts this moral right? The government? The public? Is conscious divine or not? He frowned slightly. Many thousands of years had already passed and that still perplexed the mind. To whom does the law belong? Enkidu died for defeating the bull sent by the gods, while Gilgamesh seized immortality for mankind. Does the law exist in service to man, or does man become greater with adherence to sublime order? People were still as willing to kill and die for such abstractions, even as far back as those who lived in proximity to the Neanderthals. He winced. The ability to ask why was both uplifting and its own damnation. Humanity hailed the fruit of knowledge, and it was the undeniable recognition of their own death. So much time, thought and blood, spent to regain a touch of endless and immaterial. There are two ways I can answer that, Shinji added, either with the hat of a UN representative or my own personal view. It's not like I'm directly imposing either of these beliefs on anyone. Rikazuna smirked, somewhat pleased. So the boy could think on his own, but was that enough to escape the control of the impersonal bureaucracy that saw the huddled masses as nothing more than a resource to be levered into action? That does seem to imply some conflict, doesn't it? Well... What are you required to say is the harbinger of nations? Not really. Again, it's not like I can command armies to kill on my order. His gaze clouded slightly. I just happen to go where things come to a head, and then I must give voice to what I see, that the sacrifice of a few is unavoidable for the sake of humanity. Soldiers die so that their people's way of life should continue, but the enemy is ancient, vast and cunning. Those around Rika Zuna practically dared her to insult the military. The Lehman Russ and the Legio Terminata were even such large, ungaining designs to serve as damage soak in cramped city combat. She didn't take the bait. And what do you really believe? I'm no saviour, Azuna-san. The angels are the enemies of humanity. My life's devoted to making them die. He sighed. People die. That's not acceptable. I need to be faster. There's still so much I have to learn. They really sank their claws deep into you, didn't they? The reporter thought. The messianic complex was really not all that uncommon. Her eyes tightened in contempt. She expected a little more independence, a little more unworldly genius. Perhaps in her own way, she wanted to hold on to trust. Post-impact Japan and most of all Tokyo 3 functioned according to a series of unspoken rules of conduct, of politesse and social rank. Rika Zuna knew the effect she was giving off, of presumption and acting beyond her place. She revelled in the irritation of those around her. It was her own way of breaking prejudice and hypocrisy. And unfortunately, she too was the fruit of that society, with its same self-delusion. Hikari-sama! 
Both Shinji Ikari and Rika Izuna gr- winced at the appellative. While San was the general suffix of respect, Sama was used in greater deference as towards nobility. It implied a sublimation of self under the weight of natural duty. So far, Shinji had avoided, with great effort, being called that to his face. One of the upper classmen approached, his expression indignant. He bowed low, then glared briefly at the reporter. You came back when we needed you. Isn't that enough? He said to Shinji. I was there when the streets were being cleared. It was ugly, but it had to be done. Thank you. Uh, Nishizaki Konda. He bowed again. If you hadn't arrived, I would have died. If the... Ligio Terminato, the foreign words fumbled in his speech, hadn't drawn away the things ready to just eat me. I saw them hammering a rear so close by. I don't even know how I got away, but I know I have to thank you, personally. It's okay. Happy to have been of help in some way. Shinji bowed back. He looked up, he looked up and blinked. Excuse me, but you saw my Terminators fighting at close range? The only ones who were there would be... The slightly older student looked up and noted the distance. His eyes drooped, his mouth opened and... A purple slug-like thing burst out, too fast for anyone to react. It struck at Shinji's face, knocking him over. Someone began to scream. Splotch! Rika Zuna knew of the horrendous effects of bolt weapons, but it was the first time in her experience to see someone's head literally explode. She felt warm blood and bits of bone and viscera splatter onto her face. She opened her eyes to see the guards already surrounding the younger Carrie. She felt herself being pulled away. Rika! Hey, you all right? said a voice seemingly so far away. Shit, this is messed up. Everyone remain where you are! Section 2 agents spread through the crowd. A few stood threateningly by the Kyoto 2 reporters and their van. Bolt pistols were out instead of the 9 millimeters common to the Secret Service. What happened? People were shouting. Is he alright? Soon enough, an ambulance arrived. And then, as the living wall of black suits parted, a palpable sense of relief passed through the crowd. It was electrifying to know the boy was alive. Even Rika Zuna felt it, and was ashamed of it. The paramedics also brought out a body bag. She watched Shinji and Yang enter an APC. The boy's right hand was bandaged, up to mid-forearm. Her eyes narrowed at the sight. He caught it, she remembered with disquieting disbelief. That fast. Is he that good or was he expecting it? She looked aside to a cameraman who was reviewing the footage. Sano, what do you think? Huh? He looked up, his eyebrows arched. Wait, you're asking for my opinion? The Section 2 agents were reinforced by military troops, enforcing a quarantine around the school. The other students, including the other pilots, were being sought out. Yes, she hissed. Are you just going to accept this? Well, it's like a plague, but there's no cure. The enemy can be anyone, anywhere. He shivered at that. And worse, it looks like even we can't know if they're being taken over. This is bad, Rika. Really bad. It seemed only a reasonable precaution. People submitted meekly to the demands of the military. She frowned. Somehow, it was still too suspicious, as if, as if it was all for show. Was it really that easy for an assassin, infested or not, to slip through the guards? But it wasn't as if anyone could have known she'd picked that moment to dare an interview. She sighed and looked down at her blood-splattered clothes. People reduced to non-entities, the needs of the many outweighed by the safety of the few. Or the one. Is this how it's supposed to be? Am I going to have to see how freedom dies in my lifetime? Inside the APC, rumbling towards Trident Base, Shinji stared down at his right hand. He unwrapped the bandages. Are you all right? asked Yang. Shinji exposed his undamaged palm. It's not an infection, Yang Sensei. There's no cure for it as much as there's no cure for an amputated limb. Regardless, it's disturbing. That student was able to act so normally until the very end. How many more infiltrators can there be? The Chinese admiral had to contend with the thought of a terror campaign. Mankind's greatest enemy has always been itself, Shinji sighed again. I don't like it, having to ferment fear and suspicion. If you want psychics to be trusted and respected, you must make sure their efforts are appreciated. 
Can I really reliably detect the infested ones? Oh, yes. It's easy. We did manage to pick him out. I don't know if his family's been infested too. Probably not. Shinji leaned forward to clasp his hands together under his nose. It's my fault he died. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. I must beg forgiveness from his family. Yang nodded. He would have been disappointed if the boy was so callous in the necessity of his manipulations. Still, even the genius strategist had to wonder if it was yet another mask the boy put on for his own benefit. You know, at that woman, Azuna-san, she's right in a way. It'd be too easy to abuse induced esteem. How my psychics could so quickly be turned into my own Gestapo. Shinji looked up. What's the point if it boils down to might makes right in the end? To resist temptation, Yang replied. Then even if the universe doesn't know justice, at least we can support what is good and right while we yet survive. They regarded each other warily. They were both too smart to trust completely. It was also somewhat comforting to know that there was someone there ready to fight if they lost their own inner conflicts. There was good cause to be afraid, for these two who had chosen to defend liberty knew just how closely they had to stride the line towards oppression. In his trident base was a large sprawling site. Though the trident land dreadnought stood at about half the height of an Ava, it massed as much. The place not only held Magnol's Tancred and all its weapons, but served as the build site for Trident 2 and 3. The only thing they had to request from off-site was the compact fusion reactor. The space requirements for testing and development was necessarily... huge. It also held a full battalion of UN forces. There was very little trouble in providing shelter for the newcomers. As already said, contractors around Tokyo 3 were well practiced in rapid construction. The APC rumbled in while tanks and troops set out towards the city. It wasn't enough that the rest of the country feared infection from those who had evacuated the city. Putting in a quarantine would force everyone to hide inside and sit and watch the news. The base commander had to act quickly. Colonel Nasuno had to field questions from the generals and politicians, but fortunately, Nerve both agreed and applauded his quick response. It was an uncomfortable feeling to have Gendo Akari so approving of oneself. As such, when the devious pair arrived, he was in no mood for any more of their habitual inscrutability. He was, nonetheless, surprised that they agreed. Finally, he was going to get some answers. The meeting room was large and well lit. A small table near the hot, cold water dispenser held boxes of instant coffee, powdered chocolate and tea bags. Plastic wrapped pastries were stacked up for sta snacks. Unlike Nerve, which had to build all the existing elements of an alien structure, Trident Base could plan from the start whatever redundancies or comforts they wanted, all with the assurance that they could abandon the location at any time. As such, even the conference room could serve dual purposes. Sunk deep underground and with its own air supply, it could serve as an improvised safe room. It also led to an escape tunnel. The walls were a metre thick reinforced concrete, backed by five inches of steel plate. The blast door slid and locked into place behind them. Even the electronics were kept separate from the rest of the base. No one had any illusions about why all that security was necessary. As much as they were the first line of defence for Tokyo 3, they must also be the first to take action, if ever the world needed to quickly move against Nerve for some reason. The conference table was round. The further reinforced the idea that the commanders were meant to serve, not impose policy. In the room, they were all equal, for the free flow of ideas. However, Shinji pointed to one of the chairs. Oh, uh, what the hell is that? He shouted, losing his composure. Yang smirked slightly. Like it? Any round table needs a siege perilous. The legendary seat at King Arthur's round table was reserved for the knight who'd find the Holy Grail, he explained to the others. It was fatal for anyone else to sit in it. This was carved out of a particularly large piece of ivory found in the city. It was originally a prize for a lottery, but was donated to the base by its owner. It turns out he cheated in the first place and had uncommonly bad luck since then. Shinji rubbed at his head, feeling the migraine. You... you people. He looked up at the chair. It wasn't too ornate, except that the back of the chair had two life-sized skulls forming the headrest and the armrest nubs ended in scapular-shaped flanges. It was bone white and gleaming, made out of an angel's avian skull mask, most likely Sahakriel's, the one he'd shattered with the Evangelion's fist. 
It's a skull throne. Why are you giving me a skull throne? He shouted, dismay clear on his voice. He turned aside and asked absently, Why can't I walk two steps without running into anything symbolic? Why ask me? Kensuke answered with a shrug. It's not like I recognise when I'm breaking the fourth wall. Yang went over to fix himself some tea. You'll learn to ignore it after a while. It's part of why I don't take vacations anymore. He made a long, poignant look down at his cup of tea. You can either accept that everything in this world can be made to serve a symbolic purpose, or that nothing really is. At least in this city, it all just fades into the background. Colonel Nasuno had a reputation for reliability, if not brilliance. His tanned face was the legacy of the UN's peacekeeping muster during the recovery years after impact. He held up his hand to draw attention. Before I get too confused, what is this meeting about? JSSDF command was not Tokyo Free Trident Base, but in Old Aurora. He himself had only so much authority to throw at the four people there. Hikari, Yang, him and Ada. He supposed the glasses-wearing boy was chosen for his discretion as Shinji Akari's friend, and as the link to in his. The colonel wasn't known for his imagination, but he could guess that what they had to discuss might be unpleasant for the rest of Trident Base. Everyone, after getting their cups of coffee or tea, took their seats. Very reluctantly, Shinji sat on the ivory chair. Angel Bone. He didn't go insane or spontaneously explode, so perhaps it was alright. Just, fu- just furniture, after all. So, ready to become emperor now? It was unfortunate that Colonel Nasuno was taking a sip of coffee at the time. He choked and spat and looked up with an expression of horrified confusion. Kensuke just grinned. Oh, come on, Shinji retorted dryly. Do you really think a mere two Terminator squads can allow me to take over the country? Even if I did, it'll be just like Emperor Nelson. Nothing without the support of the administrator. I don't know, Yang said calmly, taking another sip of his cup. Someone did once say 20 psychics are more of a threat to the world than an army two million strong. That would be you, Yang Sensei, Kensuke noted. It was about how China never really got their own psychic research up to speed compared to Russia. Really? Yang had completely forgotten. Well, how many do you have working for you, Mr. Carey? Forty? Sixty? Shinji winced. Close to 500 or so active, all over the world. I have 98 with me. Ah, uh, the most important question then. Yang looked uncommonly serious. Are you a psychic as well? They were all keenly reminded that while they were allies, they didn't necessarily have to be working on the same page, or even at the same side. They each had their own concerns, and perhaps even their own plans. No. Yang visibly relaxed, then turned to Colonel Nasuno. It wasn't sufficient to disarm anyone from thinking the Admiral still had contingencies at work. Oh, don't worry. I'm afraid this is a poor practical joke of mine. We're not actually talking treason or a takeover. Although, to work together, we may have to finally divulge secrets that may, or may not, be shocking. The JSSDF officer frowned. Look, you know I'm going to have to repout this to my own superiors. I won't compromise on my duties. Trident Base will obey only official orders from JSSDF, High Command, or the UN. He turned to Kensuke. And then his, if it tries anything, will be held for treason. The boy made warding gestures. Hey, hey, I'm just a helpless bystander here. I'm not a player character like you people. Shinji blinked. You mean... Character player? Like a mask? No, I mean I'm on a totally different level, he snorted. At least it's not Chief Takeda you've got here. Jeez, that guy's a conspiracy nut. He'd be foaming at the mouth to be led into a devious plot. Shinji winced, and that kind of hero worship from a married man was more than a little disturbing. The technicians and engineers were ready to build a shrine the moment they heard he'd brought room temperature superconductors with him. The holy grail of the electromechanical age. He sighed. At least Mana managed to stop them. Colonel Nasuno was not given to bursts of inspiration, but could cling to a question with dogged persistence. What's this about, then? He asked coarsely. You've spread the reports. The angels are more dangerous now, not because of their vast power, but now because the enemy is us. The most efficient slayer of man has always been other men. 
This is a simple matter of logistics. Even if my China has the largest army in the world, even they would run out of ammo in the face of the angels turning a billion people into tireless, merciless competence. Then there's the immediate threat of infiltrators, as demonstrated just a few hours ago. We're here to figure out countermeasures to further enemy attacks of this nature. Kensuke raised his hand. Armor. He glanced accusingly at Shinji. After all, isn't that the point of tactical goddamn dreadnought armor? Shinji shook his head. It's not practical. The angel can grow chitin much faster than we can make full body suits. Quantity has a quality on its own. Yeah, do you mind telling me where and how and why you got the things in the first place? Shinji winced. It's complicated. He paused and looked distant. Boston. Apparently not that complicated, Kensuke blinked. Boston? As in Massachusetts? Mass... Mass... Damn it. In America? Yes. The materials are actually from a variety of different sources, but that's where the suits were assembled. Most of the Terminate armor systems make use of technology already freely available. It was the power source and linked them all together that's the problem. Shinji shrugged. That and the cost. They needed to be rugged and easy to use. At 30 million each, it's impossible for them to be mass-produced any time soon. Kensuke let the silence drag out. You know that's 17 million more than what Leopard Ib costs, right? Shinji just shrugged again, his gentle look conveying how he felt any more questions on that note would be unnecessary. Yang was used to hard sums. I didn't care much as long as it worked. Kensuke and the base commander shared a look. The disposal of wealth was something outside of their specific spheres of reason. In the end, as long as it worked. You've got to let me have a look one of these days. It was still a technological achievement, and a raw awesome called to Kensuke. It, is it possible to adapt the suit? Of course he wanted to stomp around a bit too. You know, what actually surprises me is that you don't have one of your own. Uh, actually, you know why the pauldrons are so big? That's because most of the Mayama systems are there. The user's arms only really extend up to above the suit's elbows. The pauldrons protect where there's actual fleshy bits. Below that, it's all mechanical. The tactical dreadnought armor is so huge, it actually, because of the limits of our technology. The control systems aren't sensitive at all, but must be brute forced into responding appropriately. Shinji got another far off look. At least, the same extension for the lower limbs. The boots not only have more stabilization features, but are actually designed to take a landmine without crippling the man inside. You're saying normal people are too puny to be useful? Well, yes. What about those dudes that look like grey knights? Shinji shook his head sadly. They're not even remotely equal to the grey knights. To clarify for the others, he added, Unsurpassed holy warriors, so strong that they're not meant to fight man, but hunt demons and other creatures of darkness. It's fiction. Yang and the colonel nodded. Kensuke Ada's odd and obscure obsessions were well known. Carry on, they gestured. The force blades, the helmet, the silver armour, Kensuke huffed. Hell, some of them are even beakies. Yes, but it's psychic armour. If you actually looked it over, it's really nothing more than thin wafers of actual silver, hard leather and a crystalline mesh. The exo frame is the only thing that allows them to carry better, more conventional bulletproof armour. Enough not to slow them down while getting to slicing range. Wrist-mounted storm bolts were just too heavy to include. That was a mistake. They utterly lacked long-range striking ability. Integrating a bolt into the halberds may be possible, but... <sighs> Whole thing's even more limited than Terminate armor, because if it was just cost and production time, that can be overcome. There just aren't that many psychics out of all humanity, and the slightest bit of doubt, any faltering that will, and that armor has all the protective value of paper, that consecrated blade would break upon the NP's panoply. Kensuke looked forlorn. For once, he didn't relish the triumph of physics over reality-breaking super-rationality. Colonel Nasuno frowned and rubbed his wire moustache. Too bad, the boy didn't have all the answers after all. Oh well, it's not like we should expect a deus ex machina to drop out of nowhere all the time. He tapped at the table for attention. What makes you think that overwhelming us with numbers is actually the angels' modus operandi? They do have other bigger feats. Yeah, 
The zombie apocalypse scenario misses out on a lot of things needed to make the undead any real threat, but the simple matter of killing off much of the working population messes up the logistics. Kensuke looked at Shinji. If the angels really want to destroy humanity, why not just do that? Shinji leaned forward, putting his hands under his nose in a gendo pose. Because the Earth's cradle hasn't been taken by the angels for their own use. It's humans who hold it, and humans who can use it to the fullest. We have a new enemy here. Even Yang seemed surprised. Really? The brain slugs devour and replace brain matter. How could anyone have survived the attack the angels attack on the Earth's cradle? Simple enough, actually. By a flexible definition, it could be said that everyone did survive. It was just a matter of how much intelligence and self-awareness they managed to retain. He took a sip of tea to calm his nerves. There were certain advantages to the infestation. What we call zombification may also be immortality if one keeps his or her consciousness. Then with the ability to heal and endure beyond all human limits, several other modifications are possible. Let me put it this way. It can cure all human ailments, even the worst of pains. It removes all doubt about one's purpose in living and confers unimaginable power. The only thing really detestable about it is that the angels are the one giving it. That's nasty! That's so wrong! Kensuke put in. It also implies the angels know more about human biology than they should. This is actually have anything to do with those old rumours of UFO abductions? I mean, the angels are aliens after all. I don't think so. The mind worms aren't natural, but they are ancient. Originally, they were supposed to be blessings given to the greatest warriors. I mean, they're not even supposed to even have annelid forms. The writings showed they should be drunk, the, ro the waters of eternal life. Really now? Yang asked archly. Where did they come from? And who gave the things to the angels for use as a weapon against us? Actually, that would be my fault. Shinji replied softly. The angel. The mind worms may use angel cells, but it isn't an original constituent of its active evolution. It was grafted on later, by someone who had knowledge of both human and angel biology. You? No, but I did uncover the original colony. He gnashed his teeth, remembering. Egypt. That was where I first met Karu Nagisa, someone both human and angel. That was where he told me what he wanted for humanity, and how the weak must be cold to force man to evolve. That was why I chose mercenaries over regular troops, for the necessary emotional detachment when entire villages or cities overflowed with murderous intent. They, all have, they already had an overall idea of what Javal was. It was not, Shinji explained, the first nor the last of such enclaves. Deep in the sands of the great desert, from times long ago, when even a wreck was new and the gods dwelt with mortals, there was a city close to paradise. The rains fell at the command of those that lived there, and the sands fused into opaque glass to serve as their dwelling places. And the echoes of their spirits were written there, their dying screams ringing in the walls. It wasn't the first time angels and men warred, and back then, lacking the power of the Ava, they could only turn themselves into weapons. He told them of restless nights in the open deserts, driven by an urge he couldn't explain. He told them of stepping beyond the veil of reality in the endless haze of the waterless horizon. He tried to convey how it felt, how cyclic and how futile, that history seemed to flow around him as a snake eating its own tail. And that was where he first met Karu Nagisa. At first he thought it was another hallucination. Nagisa is... powerful. Shinji couldn't really explain without revealing Rei's own secret. While he could trust Kensuke with that knowledge, likely the geek would just find it hot. The military were only allies of convenience. He's also so very, very alone. He hates the sordid mass of humanity and would prefer to uplift them to his level. The only thing he hates more, perhaps, are the angels themselves. He said they lack all choice. He wants something between human and angel and is willing to kill off most of humanity to get it. Hmm... I assume you have some proof of this. The ancient lands were a fascination for Yang, as a historian. Were it not for the literal evidence of the angels, it would have sounded too much like one of those kooky theories, more for entertainment and making money off the gullible, than factual consideration. We're in Egypt, not at the Great Pyramids, I hope. 
It was too easy and often used as a point for ancient conspiracies. But as far as Egypt was concerned, it wasn't all that ancient. The dynasty was already old long before those were built. As for Nagisa, the records, as far as what they were able to retrieve from the UN database, there was a Kauru Nagisa as pilot for the Trident Warborns. He decided to accept Shinji's assessment of the foe, lacking any further data. Do you still have the pendant, Yang Sensei? The Chinese Admiral brought out the necklace with its occult Eldar eye. He slid it over the table to Shinji. Would you believe that people past 8,000 years ago were literally different from us today? That they lived for hundreds of years like the old myth said? That gods and demons warred as they walked the earth? The boy asked, his expression hooded. Not really. Can you support that claim? I don't have time to get any carbon dating done on that thing and... There are psychics now, even though I seem to be keep missing them. No, I don't. This thing, however, was never made with tools. I don't think it was ever touched by any hand or tool during its crafting. It was shaped with the mind and sung into existence. Both Kensuke and the Colonel looked doubtful, until Shinji whistled at the pendant. A strange keening wail filled the room as the red gem set as its eye glowed with nearly blinding light. Once that was over, everyone felt cold to the bone. It was like that feeling under the glowing attack used by the angel. Shinji's angel bone chair sprouted new spiky growth, and the boy was unnaturally still. His eyes were wide with sudden realisation of the foolishness. Sharp spines poked out from just under his ears. A millimetre off, and he would have been dead. I don't know if I can trust what someone told me, but this isn't the first time the angels tried to supplant humanity as the dominant life form on this earth, he said in a choked voice. I'm not saying anything more until someone gets a knife and cuts me loose. This isn't luck. It's ridiculous. There's been too many coincidences already. Kensuke took out a Swiss knife with its saw blade and began to file down the tips. Does this happen often? he asked. It's like there's some force that kicks in whenever anyone tries to explain anything clearly. Shinji replied bitterly. He coughed when free. Thanks. He tapped at the new spines on his chair. Interesting. I didn't really have any proof until now, but the angels and psychic energy do have some correlation. It's something close to the AT field, but I don't know. I thought you said you weren't psychic, Yang said offhand. I'm not. It is attuned to my brainwaves, though. As far as I can tell, this merely acts as a pointer, drawing power from the cash. It's glowing brighter now because of all the many psychics around the city. So you just dug out those things? Colonel Nagisa at Nasuno asked, grimacing. He refused to be sidetracked, no matter what he'd just seen. They were dancing around the issue. No matter what good intentions at the start, all those deaths did start something. Why? Well, to be fair, I didn't really know what I was going to find. It weighed heavily upon him. What made it worse was that he couldn't be sure he was still not being massively manipulated. How can the geese even find him? Or were they all just following some mouldy old prophecy? He got up slightly, then reconsidered, tapping the armrests. As you can see, angels and certain artefacts have relationships to each other. It must have seemed like paradise when one didn't need to work tools out of metal or wood, but rather reel them into being. The weapons of that age was not limited to the physical, but also the biological. It was Kensuke's turn to frown. Are we running into Clark's law here? Are you saying there really were ancient astronauts? Um, there are at least nanite colonies, space whales and teleportation portals. Unfortunately, all he knew of the moon cradle was that it was supposed to have been destroyed. The JSSDF colonel slapped his palm down on the table. This is ridiculous, he grumbled out. What's the point of this fantasizing on the far past? How do you know it wasn't just plain to death for you to find? Shinji nodded in assent. That's a valid point. Even if I had to dig, it's not like it isn't likely that a megalomaniacal psychic, dimly he could hear far off ironic laughter, was just lying to me even as he yoinked the container from my hands. Still, the past is important, he turned to Yang. Those who do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And history is often cyclic, the historian added. What happened once can happen again. You say that Second Impact was the angels succeeding. They aren't actually aliens. 
he sniffed. They're not actually from Mars. That was a good hypothesis early on, you know. The red planet was once perhaps livable. Again, Shinji veered from revealing Seal's existence. Not only that it lacked proof, but that would implicate nerve as well. We now know that angel-based teleportation works. I don't know about Mars, but there are some hints that they were once living on the moon. There are ancient writings of great beings that cover the face of the moon and live off sunlight. Among all the older myths were also hints of thermonuclear use, and some passages sounded like the effects of a moon-based super laser. Kensuke raised his hand. Mentioning this to a Kagi sensei would be specially cruel, more pissing on physics and mutilating the scientific method. Yeah, unfortunately she's still the best mind on the planet when it comes to the actual procedural defence against angel attacks, Shinji replied sadly. If anyone can figure out how this nonsense actually works, it would have to be her. No one outside of Nerve has both the background or the resources necessary for a breakthrough. Yang coughed into his fist. Well, to get back to the point, what do you think we should do now? I don't know. I've done what I can to get some allies in here. It's not that much, but every little bit helps. I think it's obvious by now that the Evangelians can't protect this city on their own. If the enemy had tried at using enough man-sized enemies any earlier, we would have lost. Hmm, that you're here means you expect us to do something about it. Yang scratched at the side of his head. It's not enough the nerve is widening the streets and putting up heavy bones of turrets, well, everywhere. We have a little problem of jurisdiction. Besides, it's more like the UN provides funding, the JSSDF the man have power, but it's in his that actually does the building, Kensuke added. Colonel Nasuno let a few moments pass. While the exchange seemed innocuous, he recognised a certain hubris about it, in deciding things without consulting either Nerve in his or the JSSDF, taking it for granted that these organisations would obey. He felt that politics was supposed to be a little more confusing than that, and that power, like the value of currency, should reflect upon something tangible and useful. He was a practical man, who knew many other officers with delusions of superiority. Very few could actually manage day's drama megalomaniacal confidence. He looked at the others in the sealed room. Even contributing a little would be step towards choosing sides. He wondered if he would need to have them shot. If we're laying our cows on the table, what makes you think those you bought here can actually be trusted? Or by extension, why should we trust you? They're mercenaries, aren't they? How can you be so sure they won't turn on us if someone offers a big enough incentive? They're my chosen, Shinji replied flatly. They've been specially selected for their strength, stature and depth of loyalty. Money's worthless if the world ends. They've already proven their commitment. The colonel repressed a sneer. How? They have no honour. They'll kill for whoever has money. Yes, but one must ask why do they need money? They paid for in blood the life and safety of their own l land. They paid well, but they're risking it all. Their families are here. They followed with their own faith to Tokyo Free. None of them speak Japanese, but still they came. Here their fathers can protect them directly, while elsewhere they could perhaps be used as leverage. The risk seems inconsequential compared to how the whole family can be together. Such strange, but worthy people. Shinji looked to Yang. I could have had screaming, unquestioning fanatics fighting for me. He smiled slightly. Or I can have Dorsai. Yang's gaze widened and his face broke into a grin. For the first time, he was genuinely impressed. Political and martial tricks were nothing special. But this... Oh, bravo! <laughs> you screened them using psychics, I suppose. It's much more vital to be secure in their loyalty. How sure are you that they won't be carefully choosing their responses? Shinji looked embarrassed. That's actually easier. I have no doubt at all they're totally dedicated to the cause. And how do you know that confidence is actually yours? It was a very troubling thought, and part of why he'd said psychics were more dangerous than whole armies. If he was willing to accept Shinji Akari really wasn't a psychic, if he was also, that explained how he could be sure. However, it would also mean he too could never be trusted, especially as he had just lied. They're a religious organisation, the boy said at last. 
I got elected prophet. Kinsuke raised his hand again, after a while. Really? So you can do miracles and tell the future now? Not that way. I suppose the only prophecy I'm allowed to make is that we all live through this. Then we simply try to make sure it's self-fulfilling. Shinji shrugged. Well, let's just say that I can be totally, truly sure in the loyalty of some of their most potent leading figures. And they would, like, totally kick the asses of those who fail to live up to their duty. Good enough, Kensuke replied. Wait, was he about to say she? Ha, <laughs> explained so much. Bastard. Colonel Nasuna rubbed at his head. His train of thought kept being derailed. Was it even possible for these people to stick to the one critically important issue? What assets do we have that are actually useful in fighting the angel for it? He looked up at the boy. How soon can you get back to your Evangelion? I can fight, sir, but it's not worth the victory to return to a dead city. Only at a last resort. But that means we need first resort. Shinji turned to Yang Gen. I... There's already the limit of what I can do. I can't think like the angels. I can't beat Nagisa with just my mind. His thoughts run to vile corners I can't reach. I don't know what they'll do next. That's why we need to prepare. But it sounds as if there isn't anything we can actually do, the colonel snarled back. This meeting is just to row our faces in how useless we are compared to nerve. Shinji winced. Sir, I have every confidence in your ability to overcome. Then also frowning, he turned to Yang. Besides, why am I expected to solve everything? I'm here to ask for help. We must fight to the fullest, or we can just die. Yang sweated. Hey, why do I have to solve everything then? Because you're the only one here not actually doing anything worth what you're being paid, Kensuke said dully. I'm not even paid all that much, the former admiral replied. Teacher salaries suck. You need more incentive, Yang Sensei? How so? Mercenary of you. Yang blanched and leaned back, crossing his arms over his chest. He closed his eyes and for a while he seemed to sleep. As the minutes dragged on, Kensuke stood up to pour tea over his head. Kensuke, what do you think is the most important discovery of the 20th century? Yang opened his eyes and asked. The nerdish boy thought it was over. Obviously, electronics changed the face of history on a scale roughly on par with the wheel. However, You said discovery. Semiconductors, he said at last. The combustion engine actually belongs to the latter parts of the 19th century, a natural step up from previous principles. Until electronic circuits, technology was just a refinement of mechanical motion. Then, boom! It's like everything became easier, easier cheaper, faster. Tools that make other tools. Precision tools. He brought out his cell phone. Multi-purpose, light rate, reliable. Dude, like, how else were we supposed to make programmable switches? Clockwork? Yang nodded. What do you think is necessary for the next paradigm shift? That's easy. Superconductors. Our technology's just going to plateau until we... He paused and blinked owlishly. Which... We... Now have, he turned to Shinji. Do you know how much that enables us? Where'd you find them anyway? Egypt, Yang asked hopefully. More samples of ancient technology? Uh, no, I found it in the sunken British Isles. I dug it out of an arrowhead lodged into my chest, he didn't add. Fortunately, like psychoreactive crystals, the material could grow and be shaped into whatever form. I have to wonder, how come no one discovered this before? Is it something we need to mine? Kensuke's eyeglasses flashed ominously. Because, man, we're going to need lots of it. It's unimaginably more precious than oil. Can I convince you folks to invade the old UK? Please? Shinji just sighed and took out a bundle of strange black fibres. I find it odd that people expected natural superconductors to be metals, with a nod to Yang. There are certain conditions that have to be met for crystal and metal to align so precisely. Psychokinetic energy is related to macroscale energy, it looks like. Kensuke frowned. So you're saying some magic is necessary for the components required for sufficiently advanced technology? Uh, yeah. <sighs> what the hell? As long as it works! He began to mumble to himself. 
efficiency of wiring means less heat loss, greater power output. We can reduce the rate of the Titan modules by almost half. He blinked. Wait, there's a crystal capacitor too. That shouldn't work by the known laws of physics either. He turned around back to Shinji. We're going to need more, a lot more of that superconducting material. With telekinetic control at a subjective level of reality, we have actual matter editing. Actually, I just call it Wraithbone. Shinji nodded again. I don't want to say anything so soon, but we have 20 tons of uncut psychoreactive capacitor crystal and 5 tons of bundled superconducting fibre still at the ships. A stretch of silence passed, while everyone stared at him with stunned disbelief. Where do you get all these wonderful toys? Yang commented, amused. Dude, let me ask again. You have any idea how much that's worth? Uh, I don't know. It's not like there's an actual market value. Considering that's 99.9% of the world's supply right there. Um, a few hundred million? A billion, maybe? <coughs> the JSSDF colonel felt like losing his mind. These madmen played around at a level he couldn't comprehend. Minds reeled with the possibilities. Kensuke thought of the implications of just having a battery pack about the size of someone's thumb that could hold enough power to one a room full of electronic equipment. Yang, unsurprisingly, wanted to ship some raw material samples to China. Shinji looked up at the ceiling, distracted. But the Vulcan Megabolter just isn't powerful enough anymore for the enemies we're going to face. We need something new. Something like Hellstorm Cannon. Now that we have both superconductors and high efficiency capacitors, how do you feel about full automatic six barrel Gatling microwave laser cannon? He continued casually. More silence. Even Yang, for a moment, looked terrified of his protege. <laughs> you really are insane. The one thing that encouraged the nations of the world to donate a not insignificant fraction of the GDP to the UN, and thereafter to UN Nerve and Tokyo Free, was that the angels seemed focused on that one place. Sure, failing there would most likely mean the end of the whole world, but at least if the angels were attacking there, the aliens were leaving the rest of the world alone. It was that which made the conflict seem somewhat surreal, captivating to watch from afar, and with the pilots easily packaged into heroic celebrities. With the Earth Cradle, now known as Black Moon, on the loose, and the unspoken threat of zombification hanging over their heads, the nations were under enormous pressure to secure their own safety. So Hakriel's bombardment was destructive, but the overall quick death made it something of a gamble. The targets were nerve sites, where Evangelians were under construction. The only other such site left was in America, well away from any populated area. As Yang had noted, the new threat was a matter of terrifying logistics. A city had so many people, and policemen were vastly outnumbered and undergunned if things actually go sour. Cities couldn't feed themselves, and trying to enforce a quarantine was only slightly less difficult than a mass evacuation. All it would take to cause such chaos as to grind entire economics to a halt would be several mind worms dropped at random across any major metropolis. It only got worse with new data from Tokyo Free that certain people could even act normally while under the infestation. Then, of course, the inherent difficulty in getting rid of it. Bolt, flame and sword, or hammer, were the only reliable methods. The head must be totally removed, for the, wo for, for the things could heal. They could be organised. Some used weapons. And worst of all, because the select few didn't seem to suffer any instant adverse effects, many would unwisely keep hoping for a cure. Adding to that, military build-up also carried its own risks, and a drain upon both the economy and emotional well-being of any nation. Gendo's speech to the UN basically consisted of an extended wager. If the angels breach the geofront, all of humanity will die. Everybody, all over, those who do not die at the moment of impact will be worst off. Slowly dying off, like starving beasts, like the dinosaurs doomed in their ignorance. What were they willing to give up? Nerve would take whatever they were willing to part with. If they viewed it as extortion, so be it. Never had protection money been so brutally accurate. Only Russia, China and America increased funding, perhaps thinking that since they were so invested in Nerve's safety already, might as well up the ante. They were targets in any case. They were the ones most at risk, and strangely enough, the ones who would die the quickest and most painlessly at the moment of their impact. 
Japan sorely needed that foreign aid, for their economy was suddenly at a shambles. It was hard to trust international contracts when the nation might not even be there anymore in the next few months, or even weeks. Martial law had to be carried out just to keep order. To many it carried, to many it carried the shades of the post-impact years, along with all the bad memories. That the black moon did not show up at all since the attack only added to the tension. The nations couldn't maintain that state of readiness for too long. The UN Assembly was in uproar. The documents were received with a mixture of scorn and disbelief. You really expect us to believe this? The delegate from Australia shouted at the official envoys. This fantasy! For this we are expected to surrender our own citizens to whatever depredations you may have in mind. The representative from France buzzed the Brazilian delegate. How much did you know of this? This power play will have consequences. I had no idea. These people are not aligned in any way with my government. They do count themselves Brazilian. They follow your laws. They record. Last I heard, they were Catholics. Uh, uh, heretics. Uh, witches. Tax evaders. Through it all, Monsenhor Dominiquez Mendoza kept silent, his face expressing no judgment. He was tall but thin to the point of emancipation. Dark rings around his eyes accentuated a rather piercing blue gaze. His hair was curly and yet to show signs of grey. Beside him stood a monk in yellow robes who had introduced himself as Kai Wei. The old man stroked his long, flowing, Gandolfian white beard in serene amusement. The UN Secretary General called for order. Then once the tumult subsided, she asked, You must admit, this is... I'm short of unbelievable. Do you have any proof other than the subjective readings upon history? The priest bowed and gestured with his palms up. Well, the society of Philhos de Santa Cristo may not have the ancestral background as my respected colleague from Javal. Our research is impeccable. We are archivists by nature, and it was partly our efforts that allowed the internal network to recover and rebuild after impact. We have correlated and corresponded with many archaeological institutions, and the facts do bear out. We, as human beings, must accept the presence of a greater predator upon our planet, and it is the existence of this said predator that also helped drive our evolution towards our current state. Doesn't it bother you that you're presenting the idea that there are literal gods, and that miracles may just be attributed to human abilities? Monsenhor Mendelssohn shook his head. That it seems independent of hereditary is enough for me. It is a blessing that should be accepted and used with a humble heart. Well, it is true that matching power to power makes it more likely. Even through the 900 years of our study and the writ carried from Uruk itself, nurture seems to have a better influence upon such skills than a natural aptitude. The Russian representative looked doubtful. In that case... Why is it necessary to grant responsibility for their actions over to a completely separate organisation? They'd lost their own people, and now it turned out that not only were there more such psychics out there, they were more powerful and far more insidious. All the risks and careful planning they did, all worthless. Are you saying we are incapable of protecting our own people? Not what I meant on it, sir, said Lama, man of peace. You are worthy and kind, despite what prior reputation your government may have had. That was why you had such great success. The accuracy of your predictions, was it not your own reward? She chose to give you what you needed and take it from us who know. The most powerful precognitive the world has known for centuries could have escaped if she so wanted. I am unsure of what you're saying here, the delegate from Albania added. Are you saying you people are too dangerous to be left to anyone's reach? Are you too weak that you have to secure yourself against all persecution? Yes, forcing tests on everyone and taking those you want. I believe you vastly overestimate the danger. It's not enough to turn yourself into your own Gestapo and overrule the government's protections over its citizens, the Australian delegate added. If what you say is true, then most of the psychics in the world are either unaware of their own abilities or just want to be left alone. You're asking them to expose themselves and to drag them out from their own homes. I can hardly see how this is supposed to help their situation. The French representative nodded. Yes, odd legends are hardly proof. Is there really any danger at all? 
The two adepts shared a look. It was Father Mendoza who answered first. The danger to us is real. For months now we've been tracking the disappearance of non-psychics, even whole communities. Considering that we pride ourselves in our secrecy and living normal lives as far as we are able, this was troubling. No one should even know just where and how we are different. The attack at PKRU base. Let it be said that while the site was secret from the rest of the world, the gathering of minds might as well have been a bonfire for those who are sensitive to such things. We at Javal had mental discipline to hide our homes. The average and unknowing unshaped talent out there. Their presence endangers themselves and all those around them, without even being aware of it, Lama Peaceman added next. Only with proper guidance would their talents be more than liabilities. You have no idea just how much pain this necessity causes us. But for the survival of the entire human race, we must stop considering ourselves special over the rest of mankind. The most dangerous place on this planet, Tokyo Free, is ironically the safest. Since we would be under attack anyway, might as well be at the most fortified location on this earth, where we may offer our own meagre efforts to the task, Monsignor Mendoza added. So it's more on, why ask for help from the rest when you can have the very best? The French representative asked archly. Some rot, replied the Javali monk. Consider it to enlightened self-interest if you must. On the basis of a sophist adventure, you're asking the UN to suspend the rights of potentially hundreds of thousands of people. You're asking militaries to cooperate in seizing and deporting their own citizens. It's insane! The representative slammed his fist down in emphasis. This new organization you want us to create and support, the UN Zaikang Kana, would hardly even have to report to the UN. How could we know you're not just grabbing power for your own sake? In fact, I doubt you even have any of the supposed abilities that separate you from the rest of humanity. Other shouts joined in. Yes, this is just some form of new fantastic racism. People should be allowed to live in peace if that's what they want. Do you really have any proof that we can't handle it? The two psychics shared a look. They sighed. Lama Peaceman tugged at his beard and looked up. Are we in danger? We are. When I sense the question you really want to ask is, are we dangerous? The Brazilian prelate, orphanage manager, and sometimes software engineer palmed his own face and groaned. There was a reason they preferred not to make a public demonstration. They stood facing the assembly within the UN Hall in Geneva. It was a closed summit, but cameras were rolling. The problem was that scepticism was endemic to humanity. The Lama took his hand away from his beard and gestured up. Podiums rose into the air. He closed his hand, and there was a sudden sound of wrenching metal. Twisted lumps of aluminium, wood and plastic, dropped with dull thumps. The answer is yes, he said flatly. Imagine this, multiple ten, a hundredfold. We will not be used as weapons against humanity. Though we live through persecution, through golden cages and the bleak denial of our own selves, in the end we fear more what the enemy can do to us, can do using us, than whatever you may imagine for yourselves. You were always too dramatic, sighed Monsenhor Mendoza. He looked up at the gathered delegates and waved his hands. They flinched. However, all he did was wave in a gesture recognisable as the all clear. This isn't the end times. If we all just work together, we have a chance, he chuckled. At least let it be someone else's problem. Let Tokyo Free shoulder the burden. Surely, you don't think that sending some psychics over there can possibly make it that much more mind-bogglingly frightening than the prospect of a wild Evangelion? Everyone winced. Not really. No. Implicit in that statement was, do you really want to worry about not just making use of these powers you don't have and don't understand, but also for it competing all the while against other nations, Nerve, and the Angels? Inevitably, they are asked, can you determine by proximity if someone has latent psychic abilities? And at the affirmative, is Shinji Akari also a psychic? No. Young Master Akari has nothing whatsoever that we can identify as signs of any psychic talent or abilities. As far as we can perceive, he is but a normal human boy, Lama Peaceman said, his tone absolutely firm. 
Ridiculously persuasive, though, for some reason, muttered Monsignor Mendoza. Louder, he added, as masters of the mental arts, we can at least assure you that a rational agreement is infinitely preferable to any form of compulsion, especially in these times. Please, let us fulfil each of our responsibilities. If you want certain assurances, certain advantages, so be it, added the other, but this must be done. And unsaid there, with or without your blessing, we must do what it takes to survive. Gifts, then please, then frets. That was the usual protocol. The offering was to save them unnecessary headache. They begged for help and understanding. It could still be much more difficult for all concerned. The weeks afterwards were also the time of the great psycho search, obliquely referred to as the witch hunt, almost immediately after the UN established a UN Adian Psychana. It was supposed to protect the few special samples of humanity. They were most at risk, as reports from Tokyo 3 showed they were being used by the angel to create the strongest mutation forms. Also, for some reason, psychics could form a crude counter to some of the AT field's most frightening abilities. At the very least, the infested ones exuded a wrongness that sufficiently talented mentalists could sense. It was still undecided if they exuded some sort of beacon for the enemy, but better to be sure. As expected, many seized upon the situation. The same new decrees that were supposed to protect psychics and encourage them to step up to be recognised instead gave way to many of them losing most of their rights. The unusual, the insane, or even some entertainers were lynched or killed by mobs acting in blind fear. Bounties were put up to bring them in. Governments and various other factions wanted to know if they could open up their own ways to defend against angels. Mistrust, abuse and experimentation awaited those who were caught in the nets. Tokyo 3 had most need of them, and promised to protect them. That it was still the most dangerous place on the planet struck everyone as too ironic. Nevertheless, to board one of the distinctive black ships was the best option for anyone who couldn't hide their talents anymore. There were sad instances, when those who simply didn't know they had any talent at all had to be ripped out of their comfortable, unknowing, normal lives. There were also those that resisted, feeling that two of the larger enclaves shouldn't necessarily represent the rest of the secret communities. It was a great betrayal. Some took even harsher measures. There is no reason for us to submit to the gadjo, said a woman clad in brightly coloured swaths of cloth. Her painted face evoked a distant, untouchable beauty. We can always just disappear. We know about persecution, and we outlived the Romans, the Mongol, the Nazis, even the Soviet. Her slim fingers dealt out the cards with the elegance of long practice. We know about the shadows. Well, this is not something you can just hide from, Rosa, replied a Caucasian man in a grey business suit. It affects everyone. Come with us. The shadows won't save you this time. His face held those bland, unremarkable features so well suited for intelligence work. Our roots go all the way back to India, too. The shadows have mercy. Do you light? No. She laid down the tarot cards. Death. The tower. The fall. Will you try to enslave us now, like all the others before you? We will sting, then disappear. The night is our home. Then the night will swallow you whole. Pray that we won't need to burn our way into the face of the great enemy. The man stood up and tapped the tower card. You know where to find us, grandmother. He left the tent, and the last skion of the rom wrapped the shadows around herself. When he turned to look again, there was nothing there but the crawling old forests. What could be done within three weeks? In many ways, the community of the Unseen were linked in a matter that predicted the internet. The vast majority of psychics were barely even that, normal people with a few lucky talents. The ones more powerful were either trained or tried even harder to disappear. It was the means that mattered, for unfortunately, no one knew the cut-off point wherein a human would become just another zombified shambler or the incredibly lethal mutation form. For surety's sake, the UN preferred to have as many such people sent to safety. There was a cellar somewhere. It was large and dimly lit, and the scent of sweat and fear and despair filled the air. There were chains and cages, 
and within lay naked and blank gazed forms. A girl, perhaps no more than fourteen years of age, struggled and cried and begged. Those holding her acted with the nonchalance of practice. Mm, pretty, but not that special. A seven, I'd say. A fat, sneering man in a purple suit began to pinch all over her flesh. I prefer someone with a little bit more meat. They last longer. While well, young girls were primarily for those who had fresh tastes, to him they represented an odd investment. In time, properly broken in, they could pay off well. It was something of a gamble, though. Not many actually lived through the early stages of breaking in. <laughs> Please, let me go! The girl blubbered out through hiccuping cuts, fits of fear. The last thing she remembered, she was skipping school. Living in such an exciting era, who had the time for that boring stuff? The next thing she knew, she was being slapped and shoved around, fondled, then sold. Whatever it is I did, I'm sorry. Please stop. My parents will g give you money. Her captor chuckled thickly. Not as sorry as you're going to be if you're not worth the virgin bonus. He showed his pudgy left pinky finger and grinned. We can always make some organs off money off your organs if you're not going to play along. Pain. Pain and humiliation. She cried and knew then nothing she could do would help. The only thing left for her was to kill herself. The blank expressions of the other girls around her told as much. There was no pity there. There wasn't even self-concern. Their lives had ended. From then on, their only hope was a reasonably kind master. But then again, would someone like that talk to a fetish merchant? She begged someone. Anyone. Save her or kill her. The miracle that never happened to any of the other girls. She could taste how they enjoyed her screams, her realisation of utter despair. She found it hard to breathe. Her vision was blacking out. And then there was light. Masonry crumpled inwards and sunlight filtered through the gap. Someone with a strange conical helmet and white robes emerged from the clouds of dust. His face was grim. His bolt pistol flashed trice and the two large thugs restraining the girl burst into a shower of gore. His eyes were bright blue and seemed to glow slightly. Anger was clear on his face. How dare you! The fat slaver tried to bluster away. The cellar was a place to hold and break in the products. Sensibly, there were no weapons there for anyone's use. The standard whips and wads were only effective against those unable to fight back. You, you don't know who you're crossing. We know some powerful people. You'll regret this, you fools! The wall continued to fall in. Something massive and golden pushed through. Great metal hands grasped at slabs of brick and crushed them into powder. Wealth is not power, the figure said in a harsh, amplified tone. Influence is not power. Let us show you the reality of it. The Terminator had to kneel just to fit in the room, the ceiling scraping off as he turned towards the other man. Have you found her? Yes. The psychic knelt and touched at the girl's forehead. She was still numb with terror. She is one of us. There may be others here, but their minds were already destroyed. He sighed. You know, I'm not really one of those ministers who must remain celibate. He of the Heraclitus merely let out a low, vaguely threatening rumble. And this is why I can't accept this suffering with any serenity. He glared at the fat man and lifted his hand. Lightning shot out from his fingers. Screams filled the room again. Death is too quick to be true justice. When it stopped, the slaver was alive, if just barely. Perhaps the UN wouldn't mind if we accidentally tear for you a few more of these underground properties while I search for more psychers, said the witch hunter with a savage grin. Our mission takes precedence over paltry national politics. UN forces attached to them were just then carefully making their way into the slave tempering cellar. Hard electronically modulated laughter filled the room, a distinctly unfriendly ho ho ho, 
A badge opened all sorts of doors, especially when it was wielded to the bracer plate of a power fist. I have no prayer. And sometimes, they were just too late. You were the last, the fruit of careful cultivation reaching back thousands of years. I will not mince words. You have failed me. The words rang in their minds as they stood in line across the main street of High Madrid. In the end, man proved to still be too small to fight against their great enemy. In the distance, a seething black mass gathered. The specialised super-heavy tank was too slow and unwieldy to be deployed at will. In Siberia, at least there was the chill upon terrain and extended support. At that moment, all they had were APCs at their back to provide covering fire. Your shield is conviction. Your armour is faith. The slightest doubt kills. There was a loud screech and the enemy charged. Mutation forms, black and long-limbed, ran along the sides of buildings in defiance of gravity. Hapless people turned to infested puppets shambled forward. The heavy machine guns opened up, carving into the enemy. The line of armoured warriors up front remained still, even as bullets ripped the air above their heads. Therefore you will not falter. You will not submit to your fear. You stand between the light and the dark. Dull pain and uncertainty, you shine. Your colour is grey, but you are not yet the guardians I require. They stood taller. Their armour was thicker and the prototype of scaled-down tactical armour. They had to sacrifice much to get that far, and had put aside some of their own most cherished traditions. For far too long they'd fought themselves as something special and blessed by fate itself, until the Earth's cradle showed them the foolishness inherent in their own mortal pride. Fear could still reach them, the only thing left to deny it, accept it, and let it pass through. Their mind powers their might. Fear was the mind killer. Simple. Infuriating. As one, they raised their left arms and their storm bolters spat out death. The enemy kept coming, for the creatures didn't know fear. They were at least perfect in that regard, truly immortal, beyond all care for their existence. The warriors met them with glorious, righteous rage, knowing that they were still just that bit removed from the ultimate in prowess, that which their oaths required. A few more generations, perhaps. But time was the one thing they lacked. The incoherent screeches of the enemy echoed through the streets. They warred back, their blades shining and stabbed into the fray. With our souls, we burn the dark! The great running battle through High Madrid ended up destroying many buildings, and not even intentionally at that. Such was the intense savagery of literally inhuman combat. Incidentally, it also convinced many of the danger in just leaving psychics unwatched and uncontrolled. Mutation forms were damn tough and hellishly fast. They were a subset of the mindworm infestation, so could even replicate pure strain forms within their bodies. The silver-clad armoured warriors of the subset Adeptus Psychana both helped and hindered the situation. Gleaming powered armour, storm bolters, and blades that could slice through tank armour as if it was paper. They were sufficiently impressive to force governments to give up some of their citizens, at the same time sending them even more, spoiling to see if they could train up a similar fighting force. The ships were, incidentally, converted luxury liners. The black paint might have been simply to serve as contrast for their walking down the ramp. Whatever colourful displays of mental prowess stood out better against stark black background. No one could really object, even if the only point was a matter of style. To do so felt even sillier, somehow. With the increased danger threat, it was necessary to rush the completion of Evangelion Unit 4 at Nerve America. The S2 engine could tap practically limitless power, like a zero-point sink. There were those who thought it just a waste to be dedicated to a war machine, but finally it was time to just pull the switch. The super solenoid engine was carefully placed within the white Evangelion Unit 4, the first true mass production Evangelion model. It stood a little taller, a little sleeker than the others, painted pure white. Its head lacked a mouth, shaped more like a knight's mask. Clean, limitless energy, for sake of irony, they decided to make the first combination trials at the very same stretch of desert once used for nuclear testing. Their super solenoid technology was represented by twin strands that looked a little like DNA. There were no problems of activation outside the Evangelion. 
It was the deep of night, and the instrument showed zero faults while on internal battery power or the umbilical cable. The engine turned on. Matter and antimatter met in a kiss of pure, all-consuming white light. Nearly everything above ground within 65 kilometres was wiped out of existence. Of the Evangelians and the hundreds of personnel, all that was left was silence. Two days later, there was a blue pattern alert.